you either live by the gun or you die by the sword. Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. And I had an idea for the intro today. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. Okay. You know when he sings? Yes. I wanted to do that, but I (laughs) can't do it. (laughs) Yes. So today we're talking about The Family Man to wrap up Nick Cage November. And start December. Yes. I was trying trying to think of the second movie to watch uh, for this Nick Cage November, and I figured I would watch uh, something I really like, a movie of his that I actually enjoy him as an actor. Yes. Um, This actually, for me, is probably the first Nick Cage movie I remember seeing. I I saw it on TV. It was was on quite a lot, I think, during the holiday season, Mm -hmm. and it's it's family-friendly enough that, like, every aunt and grandma on this planet um leaves it on tv while they're doing stuff so i'd seen it It was the first time re-watching it seriously in quite a while mostly because romantic comedies not my not my genre not so much mine either but yeah it for me this was one of the ones i actually like and it's also my first time actually doing somewhat of a deep dive into it rather than just like oh it's on i'm going back to harvest moon i feel that I also would say that this is probably one of my favorite acting performances from Nick Cage. Mm -hmm. Uh, I normally prefer his over-the-top ridiculousness. I think that's probably one of the reasons why I like him so much. But this was definitely a movie that showed off his acting skills in a much more subtle way. Yes. Yes. So, what drink do we have today, Chris? Well, I was going to buy an $800 bottle of wine, but... um, couldn't afford it, so we're having red. <laughs> I think it's sweet muscat, red moscato. That's what it says, but it looks a little purple. Um, I can see through it. It came with a screw top cap just to, you know, set the bar. <laughs> it yeah. should be fine. I've had this brand before. Prost. Prost. Yep, it's exactly how I remember it. Not mm-hmm. as sweet as I thought it was going to be, but still pretty sweet. Not as whiny as I thought it would be, but... It's there. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, The Family Man, for those of who you who are not familiar with it, yes, it's a movie about this Wall Street executive who 13 mm-hmm. years ago left his, the love of his life at the airport back when you could go up to the terminals. <sighs> yes, back before security would have definitely beaten you. <laughs> and on it honestly, this movie came out a year before 9/11. Yeah, so. no, like this this there's a lot in this movie that has that old school nostalgia feel. Mm-hmm. We'll go over more yes. of them. I have a list. <laughs> and then uh the short and nitty-gritty of it is is that he gets sent he gets a glimpse of what his life could have been if he with, had if he stayed. had stayed yeah. or if he had come back yes and there's more to that of course there but. is there's a lot to uh nitty-gritty deep dive pull apart in this movie mm-hmm. and but i think one of the reasons why i don't absolutely hate this movie like i do most romantic comedy movies is because while it is fun to pull this movie apart and deep dive into it... Well, hi, Charlie's butt. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, such a good kitty. It's five o'clock, Charlie. <laughs> He's so hungry. You never feed him. Ugh. Um, but while this movie is fun to deep dive and pull apart, and especially think about with your own personal priorities and life goals in mind there is no wrong answer to those questions i don't think or at least i haven't been able to find on the drive here Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) um which i think is one of the reasons why this movie has withstood the fact that it has aged quite significantly yes i mean not only has it aged it's just we have such a slurry and onslaught of christmas movies and i was very iffy about picking this because november is my month and december is your month and i am 
every year Christmas keeps getting bumped up further and further soon, it's going to be back in January. Well, you, we've already got Christmas in July, so why not just leave Christmas year-round? Or that town in Missouri that everyone... I, I'm from Missouri. I know exactly what town you're talking about. If if you're into Christmas, Google it. They It's their thing. I'll let them do it. That's for a different discussion. They have Christmas ornaments at a theme park. No, it, it's a theme park for Christmas, as far as I'm concerned. But <laughs> this, anyway, anyway. Um, I also think this movie, while it is technically a Christmas movie, mm-hmm. it is not so Christmas heavy that it would be misplaced watched year round. Yeah. Which is another reason why I like it, because while Christmas is my genre this year, and I do like Christmas, I am not a Christmas early advocate. In fact, I hate early Christmas. Uh, it upsets me a little bit that our dear friend Erica already has two stockings up in her home, <laughs> even though they are very pretty, and I am also excited for her to have a mantle to decorate. But it's still too early. <laughs> Is her tree up? No. No, we have to, we're going to have to talk about the tree, because her cat, Remy, is a big cat, and he's an active cat, and we're going to have to, like, put the yeah. tree, like, we're going to have to structurally engineer this tree. Tie like, it back as, to something. As a firm... Of architects and engineers. <laughs> I think we should tackle this tree. <laughs> but anyway. So. This this movie uh, should not be confused with what I kept accidentally finding, by the way. Uh, apparently in 2017, there is a TV show called The Family Man. I believe mm. it's an Indian TV show. I have seen none of it, but if I Google Family Man, that's what comes up. It is. You'll have to want to Google Google The Family Man with N- Nick Cage. Yes, or the one from 2000. Yeah, which, yeah. I mean, it does come up. It is definitely a lot of people's favorite movies, especially of the Nick Cage genre. Mm-hmm. And I see why. It's cute. Um, I think the best way to go through this one is probably to start at the beginning of the story. Yes. Because the... The connection between the beginning and then the rest of the movie is where I have a hard time connecting with this story. Okay. So the movie starts off with him, and we should be clear here, it is made very clear that they are just dating at the beginning of the movie. So his then girlfriend breaks up with him pretty much because he takes an overseas internship Well, or job. I they remember. never specifically show or talk about the breakup other than that they did at one point or more so he never came back for her yeah he never came back from his internship but he must have at some point because he now lives in new york city Mm -hmm. uh what he calls the epicenter of the world which i think from a businessman standpoint in his career that's a quote from john lennon yes and he does give that quote very nicely in the movie which was I think well done which he actually added to that that wasn't part of the script originally oh very nicely done nick yeah, no, there's actually a lot of stuff in this, and the more I've learned about, like, people talking about him, he just adds this stuff to his character that's not part of the script, but yes. fits. Yes, and, and I think this character specifically does him the most justice out of any of the characters I've seen him in so far, because it starts with him being an incredibly wealthy businessman. Mm-hmm. He's on top of his game. Is he a little Scrooge McDucky? Yes. Oh, he is straight up. He is a... Uh... Icon of capitalism, or yes. whatever his boss calls him. He, he does. Uh, he, the most memorable part of that is that he was going to make his uh, employees work on Christmas Day because they were having this ginormous deal come through, mm-hmm. which we work in a very uh, odd setting of the world where we also work arguably over a lot of holidays we shouldn't, even though... <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure buildings would still get built just fine, but it's that's a different topic. Yeah. Um so like I see where from a business standpoint he's coming from, but in the movie it is portrayed as him being horribly dickish and he is rude. Uh he doesn't have a true love of his life, he just dates around. But he doesn't seem unhappy. Mm-hmm. No, and that that's the that's the big thing of this movie. And I think why it stands through as one of the better christmas movies is that it isn't about him being unhappy with either life he no either either life well we'll get to that he's not he's not an unhappy person he's not unhappy in fact uh late uh, just a few minutes later he explains i have everything i need Mm -hmm. and i think what he meant to say is i have everything i want too uh and so but that I don't know, it puts kind of an interesting twist on it because, like all Christmas movies, we need to have some weird Christmas magic thing. 
Yeah, and they had the Christmas magic thing. But so to get back to the story a little bit before we get ahead of ourselves. Sure. Um, so after he uh, tells everyone that he wants them in on Christmas because he wants his gift to them to be the first gift of the year. And his gift comes with six zeros. Which is a lot of zeros. Yeah. In like, a, in a I, wor- I'm not going to lie. I'd work on Christmas for six zeros. Yeah, in a room with 15 people or so. At least. And from the size of the firm that he appears to be working at, like this is a couple hundred mm-hmm. people office firm. But it appears that he's only asking the higher ups to be in charge of this meeting. Yes. Uh, it sounds, he, the, the entire deal sounds like it's a very hush hush. This is going to be what puts us ahead of all of our competition. We're going to nail it. It's going to be amazing. Sort of, sort of thing. Yeah. And so after he's told everyone this, he's walking out or he's going to his office and he's told that he's got a call from Kate, his, yes, his old lover. Yeah. That he, Hasn't heard from ever since he left. Yes. Or that we're given the assumption of. Because, again, this is early 2000s. They yeah. are broke-ass college kids who definitely, definitely do not have a cell phone. No. And Even I, his cell phone is a slidey phone. It's not mm-hmm. a flip phone. It was a sliding phone. And, here's and he the, was supposed to be rich and fancy. Yes. And even then, like, he's studying abroad. I know when I was living in Germany, Mm -hmm. because I was in Germany at that time, we rarely called back to the States because it was so expensive, expensive. which, of course, that's all changed now. It has, um, but I also know, especially from being abroad in the more recent times, um, because while I didn't go overseas when I was little, my dad did. And so, yeah, we didn't get to talk to him as much as we probably would have liked, because A, it's expensive, and B, like the time difference and lining all that up with two parents who are working... (sighs) Or just in general, in life, it makes it a lot harder, especially back then. When oh, yeah. Video call was not a thing. Well, yeah, even in high school, because that was back when Skype was really starting to get its I remember thing going. everyone had to have a Skype back then. And I remember, I wouldn't Skype, but I would try and call my friends back in the States mm-hmm. because New Year's had happened already. Yeah. And I was calling from the future. <laughs> so fancy. So corny. Yes. Um, so the. There, There's a lot of bits like that that you can think about mm-hmm. as to why their relationship didn't work. And he also explains while he's leaving the airport with her that she is not being left behind. Yeah. She has gotten the internship of a lifetime, apparently. Yes. Like, this is going to set her for life. It's going to have her whole career on track sort of thing. And so I would argue that in the real, real timeline, mm-hmm. them not getting back together was a both of them problem. Yeah. Very, like... Because clearly she could get a hold of him eventually. She finds him after all those years. He also could have done that. Yes, exactly. It's the one of the things that if neither of you making if neither of you are making the effort, what's the point? Exactly. So he then decides later on that he needs to go for a walk. Yes, to pick up eggnog. To pick up eggnog because it's Christmas and he is kind of sort of alone for Christmas, but he could have a date. Well, we're also established that uh, he is going to be alone this year because yeah. the woman who he has been shagging mm-hmm. or hooked up with is uh, is uh, going home for the holiday. She's yes. going to Jersey, which, by the way, that actress was is an actual model. Oh, good for her. Yeah. That makes sense. So they were trying to find someone extremely beautiful that felt within, I guess, his league. Yes, and I would say that that is portrayed rather well. Yeah, not saying that Kate as an actress isn't gorgeous. No. She's just not in the runway movie, model gorgeous. Well, and especially in the way they have her done up in the movie, she is the hottest suburban mom possible. Mm-hmm. But they, they, the entire point of it is to make her the, the one that got away, the home yes. girl for the most of the movie. So it makes sense for her not to be portrayed as the runway one. Mm-hmm. When she's supposed to be the mom of the story. Yeah. And so Nick Cage goes to this gas station. Or no, no, not a gas station. A corner shop. Corner shop. A corner shop. And while he's picking up his eggnog, uh, there is a man um, uh, who comes in and he's acting all... He's acting... Stereotypical 2000s gangster. Very much so, and... You know, it's it's a little over the top. It's a little silly. Played by Don Cheadle, and he is 
fantastic he, in this role. He really does a good job of making his character both mysterious, over the top, and also just questionable in everything he mm-hmm. does and says. Yes. And also of note, the uh, ca- the cashier is played by the villain from Rush Hour. That's where I know him from. Because okay. if, if I remember right, it's the same director of The Family Man in Rush Hour. Yes. Yes, I think so. Yeah. I think so. But anywho, so this man comes in and he's uh says he has a lotto ticket. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. the guy behind the cash register doesn't believe him. Yeah, he doesn't want to cash this winning lotto ticket. He thinks this- he's scamming him. Yeah. Which I mean understandable reason to be concerned. Mm-hmm. So then uh the character bring Escalates it farther until it's almost a gunpoint robbery. Pull, no, he pulls he out a gun pull, and he does pull a gun. Says, "Check the ticket." Yes, sliding the ticket with his gun towards him. Yes, the only thing that makes it not a robbery is the fact that he doesn't tell him to empty the cash register. Really? Yeah. No, he's yeah. he's well in a way he in a roundabout way he kind of is. Yes, he's saying this could become more than it is, and then Nick Cage's character steps in. Yes. In the most businessman way physically mm-hmm. possible, which I feel like is it's, part of his character. Yes, it is. Very he, much so. He sees an opportunity and he's like, you know what? Here, I'll buy the ticket off of you. And then he threatens him with death. Like, do you want to die today? He's like, no. But if I buy it from you and I turn it in and it is real, then I make I'd, 30 bucks. Yeah. And this is the point in the movie where. I have questions. I might have answers for you because in listening to the uh, commentary by uh, Brent Rader, uh, David Diamond, and David Westman, writers and directors for the film, I have a very different viewpoint of this film, which I know I have annoyed my buddy Rick with (laughs) multiple questions. Good. So it is... The the hold-em-up character then... Asks Nick Cage if he has everything he needs in life. In, in a, well, after they, after they, a few more interactions, they, they leave. They leave. A few more interactions. A little bit drawn out. Uh, Don and, is drinking his eggnog. Yes, he is. And uh, he's asked. Uh, he's pretty much asked, "Do you have everything you need?" To which Nick Cage replies that he definitely does. He's mm-hmm. he is set in life, and then. Christmas magic bullshit happens, in yeah. which then Nick Cage is then given a glimpse of what his life would have been like if he had not gotten on the airplane. But I like that interaction between them, because... Not, I do too. For, first off, he's not even saying, hey, I'm going to do this to you. Nick Cage is like, you know, surely there's programs. You can help yourself kind of thing. Yeah. Pull you up by your bootstraps. I will say, like, and it is it is part of that character uh, in the writing of... Nick Cage trying to offer help and being horribly insensitive mm-hmm. and going about it in kind of arguably the wrong manner for this person that he's talking to and knows nothing about. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's kind of sent off into this other dimensional world without really being given any real reason mm-hmm. why. Like Scrooge McDuck was given a definite reason. Yeah. Scrooge McDuck was an ass through and through. He needed to learn something to be a better person. Nick Cage mm. arguably could have had the same thing, but the out the end outcome did not equal the beginning outcome. So well, this is this is the part of the equation I struggle with. Okay. And so for me, we're given the outcome that he for me, I feel it's somewhat fitting. Yes. He says he has everything, but you know from his lifestyle, even though he's happy, he walks around like something is missing from his life. Yes. Like he he holds himself very high. He's happy, but there's something that he doesn't have, but he's not hes not being open about it towards himself. This is true. And I feel like with a little bit better background on mm-hmm. Nick Cage's character, the fact that the missing piece is love would have been better comprehended in less of a stereotypical uh, formula that the movie gave us. And yeah. I'll explain more why later. Okay, yeah, um, and I'll, I'll go into why I don't feel it's so formulaic. Or, I know it is formulaic, but it's not your stereotypical X plus Y equals Z. The Z is, like, Z 
ish. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree with you there. The other part of this that I have questions on is we are told that the... And we're not really even told. We're just briefly introduced to the idea that this character who was robbing people for a lotto ticket is actually part of some organization, and that's why they're messing with Cage. Well, for me, this has always been... I always compared it to It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, that would Um, be a good comparison. Now... Where this gets in, where I have my differences with it is after listening to the commentary. Mm -hmm. And while I was listening to it, they start pointing out, this producer's a Jew, this director's a Jew, this person's a Jew. And so that started getting me into a different mindset of how to see the film. Because from my very base understanding, and there have been many questions about this to Rick. um, (laughs) Thank you very much, Rick, for all your insight. Um, my base understanding of Judaism is that God isn't there to fix everything right away. You're supposed to figure it out yourself. Sure, and that fits with this movie rather nicely. It does. It fits very well. Um, and from that, there's this he there's this very chaotic sense to it. Gotcha. And even with all the symbology we see with him walking down the street in the big tower behind him with a cross, which, by the way, they did not ask for that. That's just what they do during Christmas. This film was Ah. shot during the Christmas holiday. I forgot it was actually shot during Christmas. Mm -hmm. And New York loves Christmas. (laughs) Yes. I wonder why. (laughs) Um, But anywho, so it's this very... It's very different from It's a Wonderful Life, whereas A Wonderful Life is... This You get all the backstory, but it's all the backstory from the angel's viewpoint watching him grow up to this specific point and then them intervening. Mm-hmm. This angel is just around testing people like, hey, are you a good person? Are you a good person? Are you? Are you? Yes. And I think I think are, the... Well, no. I Here's the thing. It's, it's less of a test of are you a good person mm-hmm. in... Even the basic, most black and white sense. Because if it's in the black and white sense, I could see how it's argued that no. Mm-hmm. Both the both characters that this character eventually tests, Nick Cage and a random lady later on in the movie. The shop owner, too. Yes, and the shop owner. Uh, You know, we could say black and whitely, no. But I also think that that's leaving out a lot of background possibilities yeah. on why. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think this movie is very much one of those ambiguous gray morality films yes and i think that's probably why it is so enjoyed because Mm -hmm. it it does give you something to kind of ponder about instead of just like most hallmark movies where you can watch it and then immediately kind of forget it and throw pretty much all of it out the window which apparently you can uh audition to watch 25 hallmark movies before christmas easy easy yeah easy for for a thousand dollars oh that's not yeah uh I, if it I was, don't. Uh, I'm just, I'm not that big a Hallmark fan for a thousand dollars. I don't really watch Hallmark at all. So. You, it's not your style. Nope. But that's okay. <laughs> um, and I, I like the ambiguity of this. I will say though that because it is so ambiguous, and I am watching it in very much a non-Christmas mindset. I had to remind myself multiple times that this movie was supposed to be over Christmas. Despite them telling you in the movie and having Christmas, well, day, like there's multiple points where I had to be like, "Oh yeah, this is supposed to be Christmas movie." Well, because the, in the background of my mind, when he said organization, I didn't think Jesus, I didn't think angels, I didn't think Old Testament. I thought Men in Black. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, to me, well, I was enjoying the concept of a random alien being like, "All right, time to mess with some people." Mm. Which, you got a nice booty. <laughs> time to send you to a different dimension. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Which, because it's ambiguous, and I'm sure the director's meant for it to be much more aligned with the traditional sense, but mm-hmm. because it is left ambiguous, I do think that you could have that fun argument to yourself on where the background for all of these characters are coming from. Mm-hmm. Because while they are obviously celebrating Christmas, they say so multiple times in the movie, um, it's not so blatantly described that you couldn't easily overlook it. Well, here's my thing with that. I don't think Christmas is that big of a part of the movie. It is a blip. It is. With the exception of the fact that there is tinsel everywhere. Yeah. 
that is kind of the only reminder I had to keep reminding myself of, of why they're Christmas decorations. It's not just winter, still. it's Christmas. Especially since uh, I had to keep reminding myself that it's not just winter, it's Christmas. Also because, because having Christmas decorations out year-round is not an uncommon sight for us. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that they had Christmas decorations up honestly didn't register as Christmas to yeah. me. It just registered as house decor. <laughs> Which, I don't know what that says about our lives. Uh, well, so, anywho, back to the movie. Enough of our weird little rants. Yes, yes. Um. So, after running into Cash, who, which is the angel's name. Yes. He goes to bed. Mm-hmm, in his very nice apartment. And wakes up next to Kate. Yes. And they did a fantastic job with that shot. They did. The it was di- very good. The director was talking about how their cameraman set it up and they were trying to figure out that transition. And they just kept it dark and then transitioned over him as they lit up the scene so that way they could transition between him going to bed and him waking up. Yes. And then on top of that, we don't see Kate's face to begin with. We think, okay, maybe he went to bed with yes. another and, woman. And that is a fun... And they also leave that part of the scene hanging just long enough for you to uh, consider that option, even as a slower watching audience, mm-hmm. where it's not it's not a blip that you could like you could go back and fun find, but it gives you that opportunity to think of that for yourself as you're watching it for the first time. Yeah, and one thing I really like about this portion of the movie is he wakes up and he's immediately like. Where the hell am I? Yes, he, like, is, he is full panicking. It is one of the better uh, examples of a character waking up in the wrong place, mm-hmm. in my opinion. There's still a couple of things that I think he's a little slow to grasp. Yep. Uh, but I did like how how much he panicked. Uh, I'm very impressed he remembers her parents' names from all those years. Well, it takes him like a second to remember it. Because it does, which is I mean, very impressive still. That's a nice little thing, too, because they make it seem like they're they're not just college sweethearts. They've been dating a long time. Yes. He almost married her. So he's met her parents. They've yes. potentially spent holidays together. Definitely. But it's been 13 years since he last saw them. And so it takes a second to remember. Like, I have the same thing, too, because I've met so many people in my life. And I recognize faces, but I don't recognize names so much because it's you. such a weird, abstract thing. Yeah, and I also appreciate how, while he is full panicking, uh, he decides that the best course of action is to attempt to go back to his house, which also implies that while he doesn't normally wake up in the wrong bed, he has in the past. Yeah, not not his house, though. His apartment back in New York, yes. which is, like, penthouse. Yes, and I I appreciate the level of commitment to him attempting to get back to his old life and being confused for that long. After the point where Cash, the angel person, or alien, uh, re-intervenes and explains to him very, very briefly without really giving him mm-hmm. enough to go on, uh, that, no, this is an alternate time, it's a glimpse for you to, yes. to taste what you could you didn't have in your other life, from that point on, a lot of his decisions I have some complaints about, but they make sense for his character. So I want to talk about that second interaction because it happens so quickly. It is very he, fast. He goes to family life, wakes up on Christmas Day with children, uh-huh. and finds his uh, Corvette is not outside. Was it was a Corvette? It, yes, I think so. Something like that. Well, anywho. I so, mean, uh, a from a 2000 standpoint, fancy car. Fancy car. So he wakes up. His car's not there. He gets in a minivan. He does. And drives back to the city. Which, because you and Brian missed out on movie night, that was one of the funniest scenes when he's looking at the up the windshield. Like, he just has that very stereotypical Nick Cage meme face yes. going. And we were watching the van thinking very much to our... Uh, my husband and I watched this one together. And that van... Uh, embodies a lot of the vans that we grew up with, slash some of us still have. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of good giggles, because mm-hmm. the van also doesn't just start. It starts like an old van in winter, so the battery's taking a second to get it going. Mm-hmm. It doesn't run like he's used to. Like, he's clearly not comfortable driving yeah. it. And all of those little details, both from an, a writing standpoint, but also Nick Cage's acting with the vehicle, mm-hmm. were really delightful. And... 
also from that too, because not only do we get an interaction with him and one of his neighbors and the doorbell guy, yes, he goes back to his work to to try and continue to figure out his life. Yeah, because he's like, there's a meeting that should be going on, and finds out it's he's not there. So he goes out, and the angel pulls up in a car we saw him driving earlier. Yes. On top of that, there's a few things I want to talk about that scene because it's it's an interesting scene from what they originally wanted. Okay. They wanted the angel to be listening to rap. Okay, that would be a little stereotypical. Yes, but, very, very stereotypical. But I can see why they would pick it. Yes. But instead they chose the song Nick Cage was singing. Which I liked much better. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, that specific Corvette they found out, Nick Cage had owned that Corvette at one that point. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, he had sold it because he didn't like it. Not because of the bankruptcy stuff. But no, because this he was didn't, pre, yeah. I think. He didn't like it. Yeah. And when they showed up and he's like, I think that's my car. Of course it's your car. It might have been a Lamborghini. It was a Lamborghini, I'm pretty sure. I don't remember. I don't I don't know cars. <laughs> um But so and then when again he meets that angel, the angel gives him all this like I can't tell you, you gotta figure this stuff out on your own, which for me I felt was a great standpoint because as m I, I watch White Christmas specifically to compare it to this film because sure, I'd never sure. seen White Christmas all the way through. Okay. Yeah, and fair. so it's a it's, very it's different a good comparison. Yeah, it's a very different viewpoint of I can just snap my fingers and you go back. Yes. Cage's character has to figure it out. So he's like, I can't tell you. You have to figure it out on your own. And yes. then he gives him a bell, which I will tell you, the uh Writers and directors said it was not an homage to White Christmas. Or not, sorry, not White Christmas. It's a Wonderful Life. Why there, was I saying White Christmas? That's okay. Uh, it's a Wonderful <laughs> Life. Both there of those go. I'd never seen all the way through. <laughs> so, um, so he was. Uh, it, it wasn't an homage. It was just something they added because it would add to the next scene when he comes. For he doesn't even come home. He's he goes back to the neighborhood defeated. Yes, like just a almost a broken man at this point. Yeah, I mean he's he, had everything he's ever known taken from him. Yes, and he pulls up to these random people and he's like, "Hey, do you know where this Kate house lives. Kate lives?" <laughs> oh, hey, what's up, buddy? <laughs> like, it's his best friend. <laughs> yes, who I would argue the best friend in this movie is arguably the most realistic character. From a written standpoint, out of all of them, Nick Cage's character is over the top for a reason. From from yes, from a certain standpoint, yes, he's not a person you would normally meet. Kate's character is supposed to be this angel of a person, again, someone who you could theoretically meet, but is not a run of the mill person. No, even the daughter accepts that he is an alien very quickly, <laughs> which is why I've been making alien references. <laughs> Um, but his best friend just kind of accepts he's having a midlife crisis, mm -hmm. wants to help him through it, and then when Nick Cage attempts to make very bad life choices, his best friend pretty much tells him, no, that's a dumb idea, I'm taking your stuff. Yep. No, and that that's the thing, too, is his, I, if I remember right, they mentioned that his best friend is supposed to be a cool guy. Like, yeah. I, I, I one, guess, of, sure. one, of, one of the potentially popular kids in high school who just never left his hometown. He's just... He's a, doing his thing. Yeah, he's yeah. a good, genuine guy. He's enjoying his life. He is. He's got his weird little man cave living room. Uh, I, <laughs> he's I, rearranged. I mean, I've... that, And that's one thing. So yeah. for, this movie is another little touch on Americana life. It is a... I wouldn't even say a little bit. It oozes Americana's standard of living. Yes, which I've never understood the man cave. I I have opinions on the man cave, but only because our the man cave that my parents have is just the basement. It's not even really the man cave. Half of it is for my mom's sewing and mm -hmm. sewing room and her work room. And then part of it is also a bathroom slash uh, storage room. Yeah. So it's really more of like, Part of it is a man cave, and mm -hmm. it's really a spot for my dad and my brother to hang out so that my mom can sit peacefully and watch her own shows upstairs. Huh. <laughs> the man yeah. cave is less about them manning, I think, and more about everyone not murdering each other. Yeah, which I feel that definitions really come into question recently. But... Yeah, and I, I would say that I, I would say, though, that his man cave is 
arguably similar to our family's. It looks like it's the normal living room that his wife has allowed him to decorate mm-hmm. and rearrange to his heart's content as kind of a hobby project. Which is, I mean, yeah. If that's what if that's what you want to do, that's yeah. you. I mean, that's one point of whoever ends up with me that I will have to have a theater room because yeah, everyone needs something. And yeah, I would argue that his best friend in the movie is more of a representation of the average uh, sort of person. It's supposed to represent kind of the person watching mm-hmm. and how they are reacting to Cage through his best friend. Exactly. Or or the people around him in general, because after we're, after he takes him back home, there his wife is talking to him, and Kate is obvi- obviously angry at him yes. she she is definitely keeping her cool she's doing she's doing the best she can but there's some stellar writing in there too yes. because he says you're not my wife she's like not th- not that again i'm yes. mad i'm still mad at you yes and which is fun because it it does give the character in a cage a little bit of a loophole for not being creative enough to be like no really i don't remember who you mm-hmm. are and let's go to the hospital there's something wrong with me and that actually was uh another thing from uh nick cage's point of view yes like that he changed about that character he wanted to well, he first off wanted to figure out how his character would transition from a bachelor to all of a sudden having three kids one of them a baby mm-hmm but he wanted his character to be up front from the beginning because that's the kind of person he was. Yes. And I and think I think his character does not waver throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. It's always the same person to an extent. Yes. Uh I do think that some of the characters clearly catch on that this man does not actually know what's going on. A little bit better than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, the wife character is very oblivious to the fact that he legit doesn't know anything about his normal everyday life. That if I noticed in my husband, we would be going to the hospital because you've bumped your head or something. Yeah. <laughs> so that that part did kind of bug me, but I get it. This is a holiday Christmas feel good movie. We got to keep going on. Yeah. We don't have time for hospital bills here. Which. At this point, we're also told, uh, we're, we were shown what the bell has because he pulls out the bell and very childishly starts ringing it. Hoping that the angel will come help him. Yes. Which is, a which I did like that he rings it and his daughter shows up instead. Mm-hmm. Which, arguably, you could see her as his guiding angel through the Shows movie. up on a bike like Jigsaw. <laughs> it's a trike and they are four children, not Jigsaw. <laughs> Arguably, Jigsaw showed up like a child. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I, and I would I would argue that the the real guiding angel in this movie would be his eldest daughter, because she accepts the fact that he doesn't know what's going mm-hmm. on in the most loving way possible. She tells him that it's okay that he's an alien; he doesn't know what's happening, <laughs> and she helps guide him through his day. Yes, and not just one of the days. She even later on takes some responsibility for not warning him that their anniversary was coming up. Well, even that, we're skipping a little bit ahead because this comes shortly after uh, he goes to a Christmas party. Yeah, the Christmas party. Yeah, which is an important scene too because it does set up quite a lot. One, it sets up he has not just that one friend; he has a group of friends of varying ages. They're not yeah. just these young guys hanging out. It's a community thing. Fun fact about that house: they had to get permission to hang up the Christmas lights because it was a strictly Orthodox Jewish community. Ah, that 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 explains yes. why the houses on the other side don't was, really have lights. Yeah, the other houses in the neighborhood as briefly as you do mm-hmm. see them are not oozing Christmas like yes. their houses. But also at the party we're shown that Nicolas Cage has you see the charm in his wife. You find out that their life's not all together. There's uh one of his one of the community wives is flirting with him. Yes. He finds out she's a pro bono uh his wife is lawyer. Yeah, I believe yeah. she's a. Yeah, I wrote it down. She is a non for profit lawyer. Non for pro non profit lawyer. Yeah, and so we're shown that even the life they thought they would have, yes, is not what they ended up with. Exactly. Yeah, we we also get to see uh, a better view of 
everyone else's opinions of their life, which mm-hmm. I think in this movie weigh a little bit more than I what I think a lot of people nowadays would bother worrying about. Yeah. The community around them sees them as a perfect couple. Mm-hmm. Uh she's doing all of this nonprofit work. She's beautiful. She's fun. She's the perfect mom. He's a local businessman. He's doing and he's a good businessman. He's uh been known to help his other people in his community. He's providing for his family. He's a great dad. He's got good friends. He's part of the bowling league. From the community standpoint, from the people that he surrounds himself with, they would very much be seen as this perfect family. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of fun that we got to see before that the fact that there's a little bit of heated water here. They are not as perfect as maybe the community sees them as, but not so falling apart as other movies like to show their perfect families. Yes, exactly. And so from this party, after being shown what their life is like, uh, Nick Cage is thrust into family life. Yes, very heavily so. Which I will say, I didn't dislike that they just threw him in. Mm -hmm. Because that is arguably how your life would be if you are now part of this other life. He had all party to figure it out and he failed to do so. (laughs) Yeah, no, he did. He could have used the party to scope out all sorts of information. Uh, But he did not. He relies on his sweet little daughter for most of it. Yes. Which is fair. And at this time, we're informed that his daughter thinks he's an alien. She asks, where did my real dad go? Which I appreciate the intuitiveness that they gave his daughter only because I think even from Nick Cage and knowing his acting style, without having some form of guiding figure, I don't think this character could have made it. Mm -hmm. So the fact that, that this daughter is the one helping him it does leave Nick Cage open to continue to portray this character as kind of stupid. Not not in the way that he's educationally smart. He's just not um, like emotionally quick to adjust. He's not, as my family, to put it into purpose, I can speak English. English number one. <laughs> um, how my family puts it for me is I'm book smart, but I'm not street smart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't read people very well, and I'm pretty oblivious to a lot of things. And Nick Cage is definitely shown to be very business smart. Mm -hmm. He is very career motivated and oriented, and he is clearly not very... And, like, even from the beginning, when some of his coworkers mention, like, hey, remember that's Christmas, he's clearly not very good at putting himself in other people's shoes and thus you know, adapting from that scenario. Yeah. So because his daughter steps in, it leaves Nick Cage's character open to the fact that he never actually adjusts to that. Like he never learns how to be, you know, flexible in that sort of mindset. He never actually learns to read people in that sort of sense, which I kind of appreciate, like, because that means that by the end of the movie, the lesson that you thought he was learning is not the straightforward lesson he actually mm-hmm. learned, which I liked. Yeah, no, I I really like that too. And like this transition between businessman, we're get we're getting more into his life. His daughter tells him, "Hey, we need to go here. We need to go here," and then he goes to work. Yes, and it is not the work he wanted. No, he works as a manager of a tire sales shop. Yes, I think... And repair garage? It's a repair repair tire garage. I mean, it seems... I but know it's New Jersey. he's a salesman. Yes. He specifically sells tires, is what we are told. hmm And he... His current version of himself does not seem to enjoy the work. No. And we're not really told on whether or not his <laughs> alternative version enjoys the work either. We're kind of left to figure that out for ourselves. He opens the drawer and finds a bottle of whiskey. Yes. Which you you find out that, okay, maybe that dude needed a little bit to get through the day. Yes, but also we, we work in a we work in an office with a beer fridge, and sometimes it's just nice to have a glass with your coworkers. So we don't actually know what the alcohol's for, but it is presumed that his other self also doesn't enjoy this work. Yeah. Or to an extent. To to some extent. Because he also has been doing it for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And Where it's almost become a joke to his wife that this is not his life, this is not his wife. Yes. And I also found it kind of interesting that both of them joke about each other's paycheck 
for a good chunk of the middle of the movie. He teases her that her paycheck almost isn't worth anything. Mm -hmm. She teases him that his paycheck barely covers anything. Of course, they joke about this while they're out at one of the fanciest places he could last minute get in New York City. Of course, drinking $5 wine. But... (laughs) But still, that does not cover the cost of food that he no. ordered. So they're joking about this very low paycheck. I mean... Well, okay, so to give a little lower, perspective... Lower than what they had thought. To get a little bit perspective, because we got a little bit ahead there. Yes, sure. Uh, there's a scene where he wants to get a very nice suit. Yes. And... It is a $2,400 suit. And she's pissed off at him. There's a big fight. Yes. And she says, let's just go get funnel cakes. And he's like, fine, we'll go get funnel cakes. Yes. And then in that car scene, he's actually doing a little bit of investigation. He's trying to figure out how they got to that point. Yeah, he does He he does a nice... Uh, Nick Cage does a, a good job of portraying this guy as attempting to be slick mm-hmm. while trying to get this information out of his wife and finding out all of the hardships they have been through. They had a kid when they weren't expecting it. Yeah. She had... or. Her big Al, her dad had a heart attack, and yeah. so that's why he works at the store, is to help and make sure that the family's doing fine. Yeah. And after that, we were like, okay, maybe things are going to get better, because the next scene, she's all hot and bothered, she's ready for him, but he's not ready for her, because... He still doesn't get it. Yeah, he still doesn't get it. And, by the way, that whole scene, uh, the writers and directors... uh dotted on uh, Tia because uh, one, she was a little more womanly because she had just had a baby. Ah. Uh, referencing uh, back to one of my favorite actors. Guess who her husband was at the time? You'll have to tell me. I want to believe. <laughs> she was married to David Duchovny. Yes. Okay. More All aliens. Right. All right. There I, we go. There's my aliens for this episode. <laughs> Um, so they were dotting on her, uh, do- doting, that's doting. the word. Doting. on I her. I mean, they, they might have also had markers and put, putting dots on her. I don't know. Um, and she is very lovely. She, yes. And she did a very good job of making that scene feel fun and flirtatious. Mm-hmm. And then when she's disappointed, you're not, as an audience, left, you, you are left wondering what, like, what the magic word was that she wanted to hear. But as an audience, you're also smart enough to take a good, a better guess than what Nick Cage's yes. character made. But you're also left feeling disappointed for her, which yeah. takes some doing as an actress. And she did a great job. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's when we start to get, okay, maybe he is doing things right. There, there's some romance between them. There's some hope. You're, you're given hope <laughs> that he's finally figuring his stuff out. And then she, then there's a scene where they wake up, she says, it's your turn. Yeah. He goes to feed the baby, comes back, and she's sitting on the bed with an anniversary present. And I, I appreciate this one because, (laughs) because she gives a hint that normally Nick Cage's character is so excited to give her anniversary gifts, he can't even wait until the sun is up. Yeah. Which... I appreciated those little tidbits that she would throw in about how he normally is, because while they were vastly different than how the character is currently, it did not feel out of character. Some uh, feelings to last year? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's fine. But <laughs> we have a friend whose birthday is on the same day as my husband and I's anniversary, and uh <laughs> every year it seems like we go out for birthday celebration and both of us forget our own anniversary because we're so excited for our friend's birthday but it's fine because we both forget <laughs> um, um but, but so back that's back to how we get to this nice dinner he's yes. taking her out to a night on the town yes per his daughter's no, I shouldn't say recommendation. He did come up with this himself, because, but she did guide him. But he's also using his past life to charm her, because yes. he is a man who would know these little bistros. And, these... and not just that, he knows exactly what to order off mm-hmm. the menu. He knew which wine would have been best, could not afford it, <laughs> so he had to go for what he knew would also go with it, yes. which is a normal red. Which I completely feel for that, mm-hmm. because I always try pairing my foods, or... Generally want to have a nice dinner with you guys. I yes. try and pair the meal with a drink. Yes. Or figure something out. Yeah. 
And I won't say that him taking her out to this fancy dinner, while Mm -hmm. definitely what she not, she didn't expect or necessarily want. I think she preferred something a little bit more personally thought out. Mm -hmm. Uh, It didn't seem like she was thrown completely off by this characteristic, which I appreciate because that leads us to believe that during his alternate universe lifestyle, he's also a slick businessman who probably would have enjoyed once a month going out and finding the best bistros. Maybe he doesn't get to eat at all of them himself, but he takes the time to read up on them. Mm -hmm. He talks to people who goes to them. He knows his wine. He knows his wine. He bothers to do his digging, which as someone who in his character Mm -hmm. would have prided himself as this sort of mind reading salesman, even though he's still a tire salesman, it still fits. He still would have wanted to have that yeah. skill. And then right after this, he goes and screws it up again. Yeah, he's still he's still not quick, is he? He runs into his old boss who just happens to have a flat driving through his neighborhood. Yes. And pulls into his tire shop. I will say, though, this is part of the movie that, again, there is no wrong answer. Mm-hmm. But I can see both sides of the coin very clearly. Yeah. Because his old boss rolls in, which gives him a unique standpoint, because he knows exactly what his boss needs currently in their workplace. Mm -hmm. He knows what his boss is looking for, and he fits the bill. He knows the deal that's coming up, which is an interesting thing, because it's not like uh, the butterfly effect uh, where... It's like, what if he had done X, Y, or Z? It's not secret knowledge. No, the world has moved on, and it's like... It mo- it it's like his life as the businessman, things would have happened the exact same way whether he was there or not. Which I well, appreciate. S- slash, we also find out things are a little bit differently because they got screwed over a little bit on a deal. Yes. But. But he still knows the ins and outs of, the, outs of this company. Mm-hmm. And my husband did make a point where it, it very much felt like jumping into a career with already 18 years experience and two internships, mm-hmm. which not realistic for most people who would have been in his alternate person's shoes. But I think part of the reason that he managed to get it wasn't Mm -hmm. necessarily his inside knowledge. It was the fact that he was able to charm and smart his way into impressing this man. Yeah. Which which shows he could have done it at any time in his life. He He, really could have. He could have gone further than he had been or than he wanted to. But he it had, might not have been with that boss, yeah. but it could have been with a bigger firm. Yeah, he had, but he had his family and everything that he was Keeping thinking about. Mind. And this is the part where the two sides of the coin, I think, reflect uh, differently on different people. Mm-hmm. Because he he doesn't just land the job, he nails it. Yes. Uh, and he does so in a way where even though he's confronted by, I think, what would have been his underling in his past life is second in command. Now second mm-hmm. in command to the company or higher up than he was, who's now feeling threatened by him. He handles that situation in arguably the best way he possibly could have. Yep. He doesn't just charm his way through the boss. He's now shown he's confident and willing to put up with this other person. Yeah, And so he doesn't just nail this interview. He proves flat out that he can competently do the job and do it well Mm -hmm. so he gets all of the perks on top of it and so in his mind he is doing the best he can for his family yeah he's he's offering to get his daughter the best education money can possibly buy so i'll back up a little bit yeah so he nails this interview and then he takes kate to his to their uh the place they'll let them live in it's at a discount until they find a place. Yes. And which it's, is... It's, it is a beautiful flat in downtown New York City. I think he mentions that they get to stay there rent-free until they find a place, or they can have a discount. Almost rent-free. Almost rent-free. So he's probably taking a little bit of a pay cut for it, but he's still making a butt ton of money. And it's no bachelor pad like his last one. This no. is something that... While gorgeous, well, it is big enough to hold all of them. See, I wouldn't even call his old place a bachelor pad. It was a party pad, to an extent. It was a high-end apartment building. Very he, much so. He had a closet just for himself. Yes. That is way different than a bachelor pad. My place is a bachelor pad. A very rich New York bachelor <laughs> okay. pad. This, this 
new place that he's brought her to while fully for also fully furnished mm-hmm. uh and while absolutely stunningly gorgeous he's clearly taken into consideration that this place is big enough for all of them to come live. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have to send anyone off to boarding school. No one would have to bunk beds. There's a room for everybody, including the dog. Yes, all the furniture comes, but I bet you with that fancy deal, they could bring their own furniture and no one would say anything. They would be just fine with that. Oh, yeah. And And so I see why he's Mm -hmm. approaching this because this wasn't just his dream. This was her dream at one point, too. Yes, But at this point now, we're also getting kind of the counter of that. As well as things are going between them, he's now kind of screwed that up a little bit because now she loves the life that they're in. And now he's doing what the angel did to him. He's trying to uproot them and make them conform to what he wants. Yes. But her character is, she's like, you know what? I love you. If this is what you need at this time... If this is, w- this is what's going to make you happy, we'll do it. Yeah. Which, while it's not quite that straightforward in the movie, she does throw quite a fit. Mm-hmm. And she yeah. does get very angry at him. She does come around quickly, but I think it's movie time quickly. Yeah. It and doesn't I, feel like it's too quickly. No. And so I appreciate her willingness to be flexible <laughs> in this situation. Um, <laughs> it's not as quick as this. Uh, so I, I was watching another movie. Sorry, it made me a random tangent. It made me think of this movie I was watching. It's like this 30s movie, uh, Shadow Over Chinatown. It ends with this investigative journalist. Her love interest in the movie comes up to her and he's like, you don't have to worry about going back to work, babe. She's like, why not? I have told you about all you've done. You're fired. <laughs> why would you do that? Because no wife of mine's going to work. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I love you. And it's like, uh, yes. it's not that it's, quick of a turnaround. It's not that quick of a turnaround. She is still <laughs> mad. And it, I think it would take her and the kids a long time to adjust. But I appreciate that her mm-hmm. character does come around to try and understand where he's coming from. Yes. I don't think her character fully understands where he's coming from. Because when she says it, she says, if you need to do this, she doesn't necessarily see it as him attempting to give them things. For both of them. Yes. She sees it as him trying to fulfill his own dream, which to a, to an extent it is. Mm-hmm. I can see. And then from there we get this very, we, we start to realize that this glimpse is coming to an end. Because yes. it goes directly from this to him going out to buy a bag of salt, looking he, at how much it is. And being upset by $5. <laughs> yeah. Well, which... and on top of that, not only that, but throughout the last little bit of this middle part of the movie, we see him accepting his modern suburban life and a this, little bit more. And at this point, it's become his reality. Yes. And he has fallen in love with the kids. He's He absolutely adores them. He's re-fallen in love with his now wife. His daughter says, welcome home, dad. Yes. It's or a, welcome back to Earth. Yeah. It's very touching. Uh, he's clearly learned about what his alternate person isn't why that person is enjoying that version of his life he's learned that saying you make me hot baby is not the correct (laughs) words (laughs) yes and and so when he is flung back into his life it's once again jarring for him Mm -hmm. i mildly appreciate the fact that uh, he's still too dense to comprehend what has happened and drives all the way back in his fancy car mm-hmm. to the house that he and Kate own, knowing so, damn well that she will not be there. <laughs> so, again, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So, again, when he's buying that bag of salt, Cash shows up again. Yes. And he, this time, is the cashier, and he is testing a woman she's paid for a bottle of milk diet coke I diet think. coke or something and she gives him a 10 and she he gives her he she gives than, him a one and he gives her 10 and change you no know, she gives him a 10 and he gives her more and change back because she's like nine and he's looking at her like am i giving you too much kind of thing yeah while also at the same time and this is a brilliant scene too he's having banter back and forth with Jack. Yes. Yes. And it is interesting to see him interacting with another person. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, 
you've kind of stopped caring about Cash as a yeah. character. Well, Mostly that, because you kind of also like Nick Cage, hope you never see him again. Yeah, and that's the thing about Cash's character, and why I like this movie. Like, I, I, I like A Wonderful Life. It, it's a good, wholesome movie, but this movie holds up much better because the angel itself is just kind of there. He's this chaotic character that comes in and out, whereas this other angel, we care more for him because yes, we want him to get his wings. But at the same time, we don't really care for him either because he's just there to get his wings. He doesn't have much of a character to him to he, care for. He, I, I see where you're going. But I do like this development of Cash because he starts off as the stereotypical gangster character and quickly transitions and becomes this very well-articulated, well-spoken man. Yes. and He fits whatever role he's playing mm -hmm, to a T. Exactly. And I think that's one of the better roles in the movie, too. All of the acting in this movie is... Oh, all is of it's phenomenal. Solid. Um, but I did enjoy seeing the gymnastics that he pulled, mm -hmm. acting-wise, to get his character, who's also doing acting gymnastics, to fit whatever mold people are trying to see him yes. as. And so, at this point, we know that the end is coming. He's not going to be in this dream world, this glimpse of what could have been. Yes. And, it's a very long glimpse. And I think, which, which is great, too. And they do it in such a short time, too. Like, yeah. it could have dragged on. Like, he could have been there months. But no, it's still winter. I don't... It doesn't even feel like New Year's has happened. It could have just been... Yeah, they, but they if, don't give a hard timeline, which is nice because it lets you project kind of how long it takes mm -hmm. onto the movie. Kind of like a ground, which, uh, okay, so the part of this, no, not this movie. I'm thinking of Drive Anger. Drive Anger was inspired by Groundhog Day. Yes, it was. <laughs> um, it's kind of like that Groundhog Day where we're just given enough of like, oh, he's been here for a long time. He's learned to play the piano kind of thing. Yes. Jack has learned to be the family man. Yes. And so... This last scene, he's out walking his dog. Let lets the dog go. Which why the, don't do that? It's so rude. The writer and director, they talked about. They don't think he let the dog run free, but a lot of people think he abandoned the dog. It kind of makes it seem like he abandoned it the dog. Does. But also, like just as a general rule of thumb, please don't just let your mm -hmm. dog run free in the middle of the night. No, <laughs> it's not a good life choice. But it's it's a beautiful ending to his glimpse too, because he goes back home, he goes to bed, and he know like you can tell that his character knows that this is probably the last. Well, scratch that doesn't even really goes to bed. He goes to sleep in a chair watching Kate. Yes, because he doesn't want it to end. He's trying to stay up. Yes, and, and so then, he he knows. Yeah, he knows. So he goes to bed. And he wakes up as businessman Jack. Yes. And we know now that, oh, he still has, and he wakes up on Christmas Day. Yes. The woman he had slept with the night before, he gets a call on the phone, opens the yeah. elevator door, and she's there. Yes. And he doesn't want that anymore. He yeah. immediately goes, takes his fancy schmancy car. Yes. Fast car. So and, fast. Dr and drives out to the house that they lived in. Yes. To find her. Which I do, again, not the brightest match in the box, is he? Because no, clearly but, she doesn't live there. But at the same time, he's hoping that maybe she, maybe she and, and her <laughs> life ended up there. Uh, which is fair, but at the same time, at the beginning of the movie, he has given her number. Mm-hmm. Bro. Yes. <laughs> like, could have saved you a 45-minute drive. Yes. And then he goes to his business meeting. They're in full panic because now he's hours late. Yes. The deal has been messed up. Something's gone horribly awry. Business speak. I don't get it. Yes. And so he's like, okay, well, here's what we'll do. I'll go. I'll have drinks with them. The kids will play in the... And they'll go skiing in Aspen, and I'll have a bottle of, I'll have a bottle of whiskey with him, and we'll talk it through. We'll ease him. But he doesn't do that. At he, least he's not shown to be doing that. He misses yeah. his plane. He, well, he straight up says he's not taking his plane. Yes. Instead, he goes to see Kate. Yes. And we find out now what Kate's been doing this whole time. This whole movie, we 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 don't know what she's been doing. We've known that she's she's in New York City, but we don't know why. Yeah. But and at this point, we found out she's not. The family woman. 
Mm-mm. She is... She's a career woman. She's a career woman. She's a very well-to-do lawyer, it sounds like. And she's about to go to Paris. On her company's orders. Mm-hmm. Not just go there. Moving to Paris. Yes. What the life. And this is a great moment, too, because now we have exactly what happened at the very start of the movie. Yes. Even my husband mentioned that the role, the roles are so reversed that there was an opportunity for a, a reverse quote from itself. Yes. Which they chose not to do. I see why. But from a uh, basic standpoint, yeah. I would have appreciated it. From a well-rounded story standpoint, this is one of, in my opinion, one of the best written Christmas movies. Yes. Because now, he, now our character is put in the position of he can repeat what he did at the start of the movie and yes. g- just go he- back to what he was doing. Or he can... He has the potential to change what his future is. And he also is going into this with the the most minuscule amount Mm -hmm. of uh, emotional understanding of others that he gained in this movie. Yeah. Not a lot. He doesn't gain a lot, but he does finally understand Kate's perspective. Kate's perspective, and not only that, but what he really wants. He, He doesn't necessarily want the kids. He doesn't want the family. He wants a companion. He yes. wants the woman he loved. Or he wants to at least reconnect with someone he once had a deep emotional feeling with. Yes. And at this point, he he runs to the terminal, which now we can't cannot do. Cannot do that. Cannot do that anymore. You will be beaten. <laughs> Please do not attempt. <laughs> um, and so he shows up, and it's the exact same scene from the beginning. Yes. But she is getting ready for Paris, and he's begging her not to go. Yes. And she says but I have to, and he's like, Paris can wait. Which I appreciate because it does still leave the Mm -hmm. open end of, yeah, she missed her plane, but he counters it with, there's another plane later. Yeah. He's not telling her don't go at all. He's telling her, let's talk about this together Mm -hmm. and then move forward. Yeah. Which I I appreciate because it does leave more options at the end open. Which is great. And the ending of the film, they are sitting there, and I feel... I don't think they're at, because it feels like they could be at a restaurant. But no, I they feel, are definitely in the airport. Yeah, you they're can still in the, in the Yeah. No, I like I like that feeling of it, though. Yes. Like, they, it feels like they could be in some glassy, fancy, fancy restaurant. Sure, sure. But they're just having a cup of coffee and talking. At the airport. They're just, and that, that's, that's the beautiful thing about the movie is that it has such an ambiguous ending to it. It does. And I think. I think that and, that's probably why I don't completely hate this movie. Because mm-hmm. I normally am not a fan of the cheesy romance movies. They follow a very strict line of thought and pattern, and it gets boring quickly yeah. for me. And this one, it does follow that formula. And like I said, it does have that very, okay, this is happening here. This role is reversed. This is doing this. Oh, sure. It's predictable. But, but it's the way it ends. And I like how the director and writer talked about it, that it's a bittersweet ending. Those children that we connected with, the family and community he was a part of, they never existed. Yes. This is all just a glimpse of what could have been. And I think that's what makes this movie so powerful. They could have very easily ended with uh, credits rolling and then a montage of like family footage of them together. Sure. And oh, everything. Sure. And to an extent, I I would have appreciated an even more diverged end to the movie Mm -hmm. because, and I only say this because I am so used to seeing the general pattern of these movies, which is the three kids, the house in the suburbs, the dog, and sure you've made sacrifices, but you know, now we have our family and that's what's the most important. Whereas clearly both of them in their actual lives are career driven people. Mm -hmm. And I would have, I would have kind of appreciated a little bit more at the end credits to see them choose to continue to pursue both themselves, Mm -hmm. each other, that is, and their careers simultaneously. And I'm on the other side, too, is like, even if they just came back as friends, I think that's I think that is definitely the message of the movie. And it's not just to reconnect with a love interest. It's just to connect reconnect yeah reconnect with people on an emotional and human level yes people that you cared about that you haven't talked to in a long time yes and 
I think because this movie's ending is vague enough uh, with where they go in their life, it leads the viewers the ability to project on to the characters what they would have preferred. Mm -hmm. So if both of them end up staying, getting that house in the suburbs, well, there's nothing saying they didn't. If they both move to Paris and live the luxurious life in Paris that I always have dreamed of, they can do that. Yeah, exactly. Which is part of the fun, I think. Yeah, and they're rich. They're both. They're both so wealthy. They're both well enough. Oh, they're so they're so rich. Where if they want to spend a weekend visiting each other in Paris or New Making York, making a long distance phone call. <laughs> not not just that, a long distance flight. Yes, they can do that. Both of them managed to miss two airplane flights, neither of which are. One of them was, what, from mm -hmm. New York to Aspen, and then the other one, New York to Paris. Like, those are not cheap plane tickets. I love you, honey, but we will talk about this on the phone when I get there. This yeah. plane ticket is not repaying itself. <laughs> yes. They don't care. So <laughs> They can miss a plane ticket. Yeah. Good so, for them. I mean, this is a beautifully well-done movie. And it is wonderfully written, wonderfully acted. I do want to bring up a little bit about the music. Ah, um, Danny Elfman strikes yes. again. So I did not realize he did the composing for this, or most of the composing. There was at this point you can just kind of guess Danny Elfman, and yeah. fifty percent of the time you're going to be right. Well, he it was one of the more interesting, but also somewhat boring commentaries for me to listen to because fair. It, there's a lot of play on classical pieces in this movie. Well, not only that, but the commentary itself was very minimal. There was they completely removed the dialogue and sound effects and just let it be silent. And then when the music picked up, okay, okay, Danny Elfman would sometimes chime in and like, okay, at this point, I added more to the melody because he's that's the beautiful thing too. And I didn't catch this because I'm not super musically inclined like that. He uh, talks about like slowly he introduces parts of the melody. Yes, as Nick Cage's character grows. Yes, he does, and he also does. A very nice job of running similar tones and melodies throughout the entire mm -hmm. piece, which sitting there listening to my husband complain about <laughs> was a lot of fun <laughs> because he would be sitting there humming along with the music going, we've heard this already, or ha didn't this piece just play, or isn't this that piece? And like, probably, honey, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you might have to do a very... A musically mus inclined movie? Yeah. We should get him to do Tokyo Tribes and see how he does that. There, there's a couple of classical Disney uh, films that are a little hard to get a hold of, but now we have Disney Plus available. You know, we can uh, watch them whenever we want. I know you're not a fan of the of the Gravy Train, but it would be very fun to get Brian to have a couple of drinks and then explain to you the importance of some of those uh, well, musically based educational films. <laughs> I also found out Studio Ghibli is going to HBO Max. Join the gravy train. Welcome no. aboard. Choo-choo. <laughs> no, it's all, like, I found a picture. Someone added up all the subscription service. It's like 90 bucks. It's just like I having mean, cable. if you're going to have all of them, <sighs> pick one. I am... You can keep Netflix, and the rest of us will each get a different one, and then between all of us, together, our powers combined, we are movie friends. We are the stream team. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Actually, that's not a terrible idea. <laughs> No, that is actually what we're doing. But we'd way. have to go to each other's houses to watch it because oh, they're cracking yes. down on multiple oh. accounts. Yeah, no, no. that That's not the problem here. We, we got this. Don't worry. I got you. I do have it in my notes. It was a Ferrari. I was completely hey! wrong on every single car. Ferrari. Shows how much I know about automobiles. In your defense, it was only shown twice in the film. True. True. But your husband and Philip would know exactly what it is. And yeah. Erica would know, too. Erica would have definitely appreciated oh, that car. It yeah. was a very pretty Ferrari. <laughs> so, to wrap this nice little introduction to our thoughts on Christmas movies. Yes. What would you give this rating, Chris? Or what ra <laughs> what rating would you give this movie, Chris? Um, This movie, in the realm of both... Christmas and romance comedies is definitely a 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. It's beautifully written. It's wonderfully acted. Um, it's not over the top comedy. It's enjoyable for all ages and all walks of life. With that said, if you are not a romantic comedy person or not a Christmas person, you could easily skip this movie and continue your life in the action world just fine. Yeah. I would say... For as the movie as a whole, 
I would definitely say give this movie at least a once watch. Um, preferably with family and friends. It, if, you, if you're going to be forced to sit down and watch something with grandma, this is a good one. Yes. Um, as a Nick Cage movie, definitely. Yeah. This is one of his best roles, one of his movies. On a level of regular acting to mega acting, what do you think? This is definitely his most refined normal acting. Yes. And because of that, I can see what some of our coworkers were saying about him being a stellar actor. Yes. I can too with just this year really deep diving into hit more of his movies and his roles. For sure. If you if you've only experienced Nick Cage, how I think a lot of us younger generation have experienced Nick Cage with the uh, over the top action and craziness. While that is fun, if you like Nick Cage and you'd like to see the breadth of his acting, this is definitely a good watch. Yes. You will easily see him being able to switch his character from this over egoed um, sales CEO sort of character to an over egoed dad. Yeah. And he does so seamlessly and flawlessly, and it is perfect the whole way through. Yeah, no, he is flaw. I don't want to say flawless because everyone has their faults, but flawless as Nick Cage can be. Yes, this movie is one of my favorites. It is a holiday film for me. I don't watch it every year, but I do try and get around to it every now and then. Sure. Um, yeah, this is a good. I wouldn't say it's an every year film, but this no. is a good every once in a while film. Mm -hmm. If it's on ABC, I'm gonna watch it. Oh yeah, on TV or someone else suggests it. Yeah, I'm down to watch it. Sure. It is fantastic. Definitely. So. Anywho, this has been the good, the bad, and the weird. Thanks for listening. Peace.